Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And we're in a people aquarium at Microsoft Build 2018. Lots of noise and people. I can see sunlight in Seattle. That's weird. It is kind of strange. It's very rare, oh, but exciting. No, it's looking a little cloudy, Richard, oh, yeah. just as you say that. Yeah, a little uh, blue sky, a little white. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's going to be a great show. Raymond Chen is here. Jason Watson is here. We're going to be talking to them about Windows sets. But first, let's roll the music because you know what's coming. Better know a framework. <laughs> All right, dude. What do you got? So it's it's kind of kismet how this happened. Um, Better No Framework has turned into this thing where I just find these random things on the internet and talk about them. But uh, I had no idea what Windows sets were, and uh, I, I looked it up, and, well, you'll see. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, uh, this is interesting because it's called Station. And if you go to getstation.com, this is essentially a, a way to... Uh, it's called a smart dock and it goes to the left in your browser and it automatically groups your pages by application so that it's a different way it's sort of like tabs or sets or groups but uh, you organize them your way and it it's the claims to clean up all the, the tab mania on a web app so the, what they say is switching context is a pain become a multitasking beast with quick switch <laughs> No need to remember where you put things in the first place. The quick switch. Yes, you too could, can could stop using your brain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no need to remember where you put stuff in the first place. I need to tell my kids about this. This is awesome. Yes, this is crazy. Uh, I have to try it, though. I haven't tried it, but somebody, uh, I think it was Joel Hewlin, uh, showed this to us. The quick switch is an easy central way to search among your apps and pages. That open spreadsheet, to-do list, or document is now just a click away. Here's another one. Getting distracted easily? Station has been designed as a work-only, distraction-free platform. Adderall yes, for your computer. your kids will not bother you <laughs> if you use Station. That's awesome. You know another way to make sure your kids don't bother you? Just, just like show them a YouTube video yeah. and let them click on anything they want. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like good for hours. Never hear from them again. You know, yeah, like they, they might remember you when they get hungry. Yeah. <laughs> It's awesome. Well, anyway, that's it, it's just kind of kismet how that happened. Yeah. You know, we're, but we're going to talk about Windows sets with uh, with Raymond and, awesome. and Jason in a minute. Who's talking to us? Grab the comment off the show 1542, the one we did just a little while ago with Mark Seaman talking about how constraints liberate. It was a great show. Uh, you know, Mark always does this to us. He gets us thinking, and you can certainly see it in the comments because there's lots of conversation going on there. Right. And this particular comment comes from Ewan McKeeran. I don't know, too many vowels. It's one of those names. Okay. Sorry, Ewan. Uh, it was an interesting episode, but I l was left unconvinced that the notion of a constraint is something I can really usefully use, tricky, Yeah. in thinking about coding, because it's too general. The constraints discussed seem to split into two categories, those that stop you from doing good things and those that stop you from doing bad things, mm -hmm. which is fair, you know. I, I had the same idea. Yeah, the yeah. you know, memory having memory management handled for you as a constraint right. just means you don't have to worry about all that stuff. But right. does that necessarily mean you do bad things? I don't know. It works both ways. But um, it means you can do more, not less. Right. Which and more, is the and, other side of and it. And spend less attention on that. But he goes on to say the first category may actually be useful and it will force you down paths that you wouldn't normally consider like the example of a restaurant restricting itself to just local food, but the majority of possible constraints in the category will just be harmful. For instance, imagine being constrained to coding in a spacesuit or in, without using the top row of keys in a keyboard or hiring only people who have handled iguanas. <laughs> Iguana handlers. The second category of constraints are those that stop you from doing bad things like constructing your own dependencies or writing 300-line methods or whatever. It seems to me that the important questions surround what distinguishes the second category from the first and why, and the answers to these questions don't seem to m make themselves an interesting use of the notion of constraint. And I mean, we just didn't explain it well enough because I also, Maybe. you know, it's rare that it's just like bad things. The idea of surrendering control over memory means it limits a bunch of capabilities. You're definitely living in constraint, but also limits a bunch of worry. There's a bunch right. of bugs you can't create. Yeah. So it's not necessary, but you know, sometimes you can do good things with memory mm -hmm. at a certain price. So mm. I didn't think it was quite that granular. Either way, Ewan, thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code Buy is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code Buy, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there, we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code Buy. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. 
Uh, we set them up. Uh, <sighs> we I, stack them on in different tier, in, in different <laughs> windows together and switch between them automatically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Your kids will never bother you again. That's it. All right. Uh, okay, let's uh, introduce our guest. Raymond Chen, of course, is a programmer at Microsoft Corporation who has been involved in the evolution of Windows for more than 25 years. In 2003, Chen began a website known as The Old New Thing, which has grown in popularity far beyond his wildest imagination, a development which still gives him the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys clearly did not read this before you had to read it. No. <laughs> the website spawned a book, coincidentally also titled The Old New Thing, from Addison Wesley in 2007, which is when we interviewed you the last time. And uh, Raymond currently appears regularly on MSDN Channel 9's One Dev Minute channel in the One Dev Question video series. And he is still struggling with the instructions that the speaker biography should be 150 words or less, <laughs> including spaces. <laughs> uh, Jason Watson is a senior program manager on the Windows Shell team, which is part of the Experience and Devices group at Microsoft. He's focused on building developer APIs and core user navigation experiences in Windows for sets and has worked at Microsoft for about 12 years. Previously, Jason worked on developer monetization and analytics features from Dev Center, Project Astoria, client SDKs for Azure IoT, and toolkits for Windows Embedded. He enjoys living in the beautiful Pacific Northwest with his family. Welcome, Jason. Hi, it's good to be here. Good to have you here. Okay, first of all, an apology to uh, our listeners from 2007 who remember when you were on the show last time. I took some real flack for, for just engaging you on y your knitting habit. And See, I don't, I don't, I don't time. understand what, what, what the concern is. Like, knitting is a great hobby. Right. It's a I don't understand why people got so upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least I didn't get into yarn untangling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a whole community of yarn untangling. Are we going to talk about threads? Is, are we talking about threads now? <laughs> I think yes. we're talking about threads. I guess. But anyway, <laughs> um, it was, it's an honor to have you back on the show. And uh, you obviously have done a lot in Windows and uh, I managed to keep myself alive. I I'm, I'm yeah. always consider that to be a primary accomplishment. Yeah, absolutely. But so that long in Windows, I mean, Windows has gone through a lot in that time span. Some good days and some not so good days. I mean, right now, isn't Terry Myerson on leaving or left? And, you know, the teams have only re would again? We're yeah, ap ap apparently there's a lot of, the, the, the great thing is that all of, all of these high level reorg stuff, yeah. like I learn about it from reading the press. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> like so the it first time I, that much, ex huh? it impacts me so much that I have to go like read it, read it like on, you know, some website somewhere. Right. It's like, it's hey, Microsoft's undergoing this big reorg. I'm like, oh, really? Well, really? Oh, maybe I should read about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I, we it's like something I, I learned in school. Um, I, I studied mathematics, and, and my professor explained that you know you can you can develop this nice theory of how things work, and all the all the pieces of it are interconnected, but the entire structure can move around, like the the foundation. Mm. The foundation you can actually like you can move a house. Yep. As long as the interconnections are maintained. And, and so, you know, like the, the parts of Windows that I work on are usually these sort of nice self-contained little pieces. Mm. And sure, we might get, you know, dug up and planted somewhere else, but, but our, the plant is still intact. Yeah. And so, like, anything that happens more than about three manager levels above me uh, is just sort of like, oh, it's, you know, I'm, I've, my plant has been transplanted <laughs> to another garden. That's, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk Windows Sets. What is this? So Windows Sets, is a, it's, it's a new way of grouping apps and web content together uh, for users. Uh, the biggest value add that we see Sets brings to the table for customers is, is not just being able to bring these things together for a particular existing workflow at this point in time, but being able to pick up from that set of activities um, at a future time on the same device or on a different device. So it's really different device. Yes. So this idea that I could be in the middle of a bunch of work with a bunch of windows open, maybe an app, maybe some web pages, and then go somewhere else and be able to pick up right where I left off. That's exactly right. That's wow. really, that's that really spooky. Cool. Yes. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you will never ever have the excuse of saying, I'm not at work. Yeah, <laughs> my work follows me everywhere. That's right. Hey, I had that with a BlackBerry 20 years ago, but. <laughs> and so does this manifest shape. itself mostly in the UI? 
That's right. So uh, right now we are, we're kind of treating SETS as an experiment. Uh, we're being very uh, controlled about the rollout with insiders today. Okay. Uh, and um, the way we view SETS, it's, it's really a collection of activities for uh, a customer to sort of group together and get back to. Right. Um, the way we express that right now on desktop is essentially um, as a group of windows that are sort of tapped together. This is sort of an implicit way mm. for a user to express that these things are related. Okay. Uh, and so that's how we're expressing sets now. But um, the way we kind of think about it you know, going forward in the future is uh, you know, the way a set of things that I care about that are related should be expressed. Uh, you know, the way it should be expressed may be different depending upon the type of device or the type of um, sure. you know, the place I'm at, whatever the context is. And so uh, we'll say that tapping is sort of the first way we would express sets Right. Can I store that relationship? So like, I now have an icon that represents open these six things? So right now, the way a user would curate a set is, is by essentially taking windows together and grouping them together. Right. Um, and then there's this, this, this concept of uh, a set that's sort of stored in the operating system and then ultimately in that user's graph for the devices that they own. Okay. Um, and then that would manifest itself in different surfaces on, on windows. Hmm. Uh, there isn't right now an explicit way for a user to say, Hey, this thing is a set of a particular name. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, right. I want to. I want to have my. I'm work. I'm making .NET Rocks episodes, right? right. So right. I want my administration client open here, yeah. and I need uh, my lookup pages over there, and I need my Audacity thing here. Like, I, it's nice to just sort of go click, put all those things in place. Right. You know, there is a ritual I have to getting ready to record, yeah. where I sort of get all those things in yeah, place. Yeah, same here. Uh, right, so see. if you if you if you play with the uh, insider builds, you can see that. Um, sets do manifest themselves as an entity in the timeline. Mm -hmm. So you can go back through your timeline and say, aha, here's, here's the thing that represents you know, the, the, the show notes and the other ancillary information. I can just, you can click that one tile out of your timeline and that will bring back the whole Take set. Take it back to that. Yeah. Timeline. Yeah, where do timelines appear? Yeah, what's a timeline? Timeline, timelines is this button that, er, that is sitting on your machine that everybody, whenever I show it to them, they're like, I never even noticed that button before. If you go down to your taskbar, in between the Cortana text box and your, uh, the icons on your taskbar, right. there's this thing that looks like some sideways rectangles. Yeah, task right. view. Yeah, task view. If you click that puppy, up's going to come a view of your open windows. And right. then just at the bottom of the screen, there's a little peak of things uh, of what we call your timeline. It's a peak of the activities that we've been recording, uh, the things that you've been doing, so you can get back to them. And so you can scroll that up, and then you will see all of these lovely cards that so we generated. I just see a, a plus key with new desktop. Ah, because you need to get a newer machine. There you go. Uh, a newer old machine? version of Win 10. Yes. Or uh, a newer the, build. The time, timeline came out in the April update. That's Is right. that right? Oh, so, that's right. Okay. So uh, once, when the April update starts showing up on everybody's machine, Got it. Uh, well, that, he, that you and I are both button. in the same mindset of when we're getting ready to go on the road, thou shalt not yeah. update your machine. Well, yeah, <laughs> you don't. The last, the last thing you do is move things around before that's right, an important before thing. you travel. Yes. Okay. Well, that's um, good to know. But that button will turn into a timeline button. Wow. Yeah, so with, with, with timeline, you can imagine, like, if I was working on, like, a document, let's say at noon yesterday at Starbucks, and uh, the thing that I immediately remember is sort of what I was working on when. Um, right. You know, the ability to kind of scroll through your task view and being able to say, hey, at noon, here are the things. Oh, that's the document. And clicking on that document and getting back into it really easily without having to sort of... Don't have to remember so the document that's name. Right, that's I right. I didn't remember what app you were using. I might have been exactly. working in OneNote or, or Word or any of those things. Is it like right. the time machine? Kind of like you go back to a point in time and what you were doing shows up right then? No. <laughs> so, okay. So we'll say... It's a timeline of the activities you were previously engaged in, but okay. um, we're, we're not we're not saving state, right? right. In terms of uh, uh, well, you wouldn't want that anyway. You no, want like right. all the edits. Right. You, you return you return to an activity from like last week. Yeah, it's not like you want all the edits that you did in the last yeah, six yeah, days to be thrown yeah. away. Right. We'll take you back challenges. to that document as the document is today. But we right. remembered that oh, you were working on this document yeah. and you had these other web pages open and that sort of thing. Okay. Bring them all together so again sure so you can a, resume your activity. There is a way to defeat that. If I threw another machine, somehow remove that file or something, you're, when you try and jump back in the timeline, it's go, well... Oh, so, oh that you, file's gone. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You were running this app at that time but you're working on this file and that file's not there anymore. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But that's fair, you know. They, they still, that basic, you are keeping track of a, was this app 
with with know, this file. That, this that's file. Right. That's is right. there a security context around that now, based on this account or something like that? Well, they're they're all tied to your account. That's to right. Your account. So it's not that's like right. it's not like uh, sure. you know, you're going to be able to see what Carl's up to. Unless no, he lets you. But it, but I also I do you live like. in a number of <laughs> accounts, right? I'm very much a just enough administration kind of guy, so I try and live in a domain account, but I also have admin accounts for certain things. And right. so it's actually one of my challenges is I was working on this thing, but I may have been in an admin account on this other machine when I did it. Hmm. I... I don't think we know the answer to that. Yeah, no, and I, and I, I've also been like enjoying this. Like you're operating with you guys multiple are identities. thinking about yeah. your product while yes. I'm sort of exploring the idea too, because it's certainly not baked. You're real, well That's right. I'll basis. say so. Roaming is is one of the features that is sort of the improvements underway. Um, mm -hmm. So you won't see that in the builds that we have now, but that is certainly a um, feature that we are actively working and thinking through. Speaking of roaming, you maybe yeah. there was a thing we heard it was it build last year called Project Rome. This is all yes. part of this all part of the Microsoft Graph. Yes, the Microsoft yeah. Graph. And Rome right. was part of Graph yes. as well. That's it's right. Sort of this umbrella of you know, it took me a long time to figure out the pun in the name Project Rome because <laughs> <laughs> it was R O M E, R O M E, yeah. not R O A M. Yeah, yeah. I'm I I am more of a reading person, not a listening person. Right, so right. I never said it out loud. <laughs> uh, and then when I said, and then when I heard it said out loud, I like, hey, wait a second, there's a pun in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is, I think people are even just confused about Microsoft Graph, like what that is alone, because it just seems to be, there's times where you're like, it's all encompassing, it's all these different things. Right. And uh, I don't know that many people have even heard the term Project Rome, it's only us folks that were at Build in those weirder sessions where they even brought it up. But am, am I wrong in just thinking in terms of a security context, like an identity, a device, an app, and all the combinations therein? I, I think you're asking the wrong people. Okay, <laughs> fair. We should, we should pull in the Project Rome people. They'll yeah, probably yeah, be a little yeah. better at it. So when, uh, uh, there's also this idea with sets that app Windows applications can have tabs, right? That's right. So not just the OS has a set of apps, but your apps themselves can have sets. Yeah, I'll say the, uh, uh, the key value proposition of sets um, for users is, is really helping users to group related activities that they engage in. And yeah. the activities they engage in is, is not just the stuff we provide in the OS. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so, so yes, applications can get the tab, uh, which, which helps users to be able to group these things together with other web content, other apps. Yeah. Is this something a developer needs to implement in an app for it to be part of that tab set, or is there so a way the, around that? The answer that? is depends. For uh, for a ton of apps, the answer is no. Okay. Uh, so if you if you are a developer and you're writing a UWP application, uh, then then no, there's there's no extra work required to participate in being grouped with other windows. Mm. Uh, we have there are things you can do to make the experience richer for for customers. Right. But just to get the tab, uh, no. Uh, if you're writing a Win32 application, which are just as important as UWP applications. Um, the answer depends upon if you're customizing the title bar, uh, because we are being very careful in terms of don't um, break things. Don't breaking things. That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> and so, if you're customizing the title bar today, uh, you don't get the tab. That's something we're exploring for the future. Like, how can we do this hmm. um, in ways that will respect uh, 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 app compat? And it's right. a very tough but only if you're problem. playing with the title bar. If you've left it alone, then you should just work. That's right. Or if, if like Office for the Win32 products. Uh, you can call an API that we're introducing to see if sets is enabled in the system. Mm. And with this API, uh, you can choose to make adjustments in the app to respond. And so, for example, what Office is doing today, uh, if you're an Office Insider, you can see this on a, on a build of sets. Um, they check to see if sets is enabled. And if it is, they choose to shift custom uh, content in the title bar, the customized title bar content, into their app area. Mm. Okay. That gives them the tab. It gets rid of that problem. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, guys, hold that thought right there while we take a moment for this very important message. Support for .NET Rocks is brought to you by Conversational UI from Progress Telerik and Kendo UI. Conversational UI are chatbot framework agnostic user interface controls and components that enable .NET and JavaScript developers to create modern conversational chatbot experiences in their web, mobile, and desktop applications. The industry's first package set of user interface components built specifically for chatbots are available as part of Telerik's ASP.NET AJAX, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core, WinForms, WPF, Xamarin Products, and Kendo UI for jQuery, Angular, Vue, React, PHP, and JSP libraries. 
by implementing key UI design features such as calendars, date pickers, list views, and others that are included in the tool sets, developers will be able to improve chatbot conversation through visual elements. For more information, visit Telerik.com slash conversational dash UI. And we're back. It's .NET Rocks. We're talking to Raymond Chen and Jason Watson about Windows sets. And, uh, and you were about to make a point about... Um, I'm just thinking from a programmability model, just being notified, your app being notified, hey, you're in a tab set now. Right. Or you're, you're, ne you're now in a set of some kind. So then it's, like you said, with the office folks, they're going, okay, well, we'll grab what's normal on the title bar and we'll stick it down here so it's not affected right. And, right. and we can, can continue. Although, I guess, how far can you go with this? What, what programmability would there be against, ta uh, against the sets? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll start with, uh, uh, so... The one sort of obvious thing, I think, from a visual point of view is, is just, uh, you know, what does a tab look like? Right. And so making sure that that tab feels really connected visually with your app. Um, and if, if you're a Win32 application, for instance, we have new APIs that are coming out where you can really control the visuals and make it sort of feel connected with the app. You can control colors, the icon. Um, and for UWP, this, this story is, is pretty much the same. Right. Uh, the more powerful thing is, is really related to the experience of getting back into an activity. So uh, you know, it, the value of actually participating, participating in sets is not to get the tab. It's, it's the downstream value of users can get back into your lap tab later. Right. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, let's say I, as a, as a user, I open a document. Um, it's a spreadsheet. Then I tab with a spreadsheet an application that basically uh, uh, is, is related to that sort of, um, will provide content that will eventually go into that spreadsheet, right? And then imagine I close this because I get interrupted. I get interrupted like day in, day out. Sure. Uh, and then later in the day or tomorrow, some point in the future, I open up the spreadsheet because that's the, the first thing I think of to get back into that flow. Uh, and the system can remind me, hey, you had this thing tab before. Would you like to bring this app back? And so I say yes, and the app comes back as part of that tab. So basic experience is we relaunch the app and the user can then sort of navigate back into the experience within the app that they want right. to, to finish the task. Yeah, mm. so more, most recently used list kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. The richer experience, and this is where the developer opportunity is, is um, with some extra work, the app can actually re, sort of, we'll say rehydrate or just sort of restore an activity, yeah. like an experience that basically is exactly pick up where you left off. Right. So imagine if it remembers your scroll position, uh, the last time you closed that set, if it remembered uh, the actual page you're on in that mm. app and so forth. And so giving that customer, that user, the really, real sort of you know, continuity of experience or pick up where you left off, I think that's the real value. It's and that's just a, an extension of saving the state. That's right, that's a, right. In a project or a session or whatever document you're opening. That's right. Yeah. Without actually saving all the data per se, so that you are on the latest version, but where you were last looking, kind, right. of, kind of mindset. So I'm trying to imagine, you know, as the developer of Windows apps, you're thinking and listening to this and saying, oh, maybe how does my app, like, I don't, I don't have tabs in there now for people to have, like, multiple work surfaces. Is this going to, like, you know, if I have a really memory rich app that's going to, you know, it takes up a lot of stuff. Am I really going to want to duplicate all of these for the diff you know with tabs for the for different scenarios that my user is particularly going to well it's do? it's it's not that like every every time the user does something new in your app we run a new copy of your app uh, like oh, if, it's not so like everything my app does in a tab it's not that right there's still like you know one tab that represents your app okay and so for example like if it's uh, say a, a podcast listener type app mm. um, you know, it's just it's still one app running inside one window, and maybe you can like switch to a different channel, listen to a different, uh, you know, listen to a different episode, mm. and each of those is an activity within your app, and the system will keep track of these activities, and advertise them on the timeline. So you can go back to the timeline, like, oh, there was I was in the middle of some podcast yesterday. Mm. I want to pick. I want to you know go back to it. You can flip through your timeline and say, oh, there it was. It was the .NET Rocks episode number fifteen oh five or whatever it was. Um, and so, you know, maybe you listen to three or four different podcasts that day. They'll each appear as a separate mm. uh, item in your timeline, so you can get back to each of them. Um, it's it's not like when when you come back to you know the uh, some other document, and we're going to say, hey, you were listening to these three other yeah. podcasts. It's like, no, no, we'll we'll pick the one that you were listening to. I see. Most recently with this with right. with this document. So it's not like a tab UI where you have different containers whenever 
a different tab. The, t the tab sort of is a new concept for developers, isn't it? Mm, or is well, it not? I mean the, the, well, the, the tab is, is basically a representation of the window. Mm -hmm. um, I see. So you, you can think of the tab as a miniature title bar. Like we, we, we take your app, and instead of drawing the full title bar, we draw a little miniature guy so we can jam a whole bunch of little miniature title bars next to each other. Okay. Right. And then you switch among your apps that we're, way. We're, we're not changing oh, how, how windowing works on windows. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's purely the presentation of those windows, right? Uh, I, think, I think what I was hearing... Because you used to alt-tab, well, you still do alt-tab between apps. And, and you, you, you will still, still be works. able to with, right. with sets. In yeah, fact. I'm trying to disambiguate between what people consider a tab UI now right. and... Yeah. Right, so Carl, I, I think... Um, here, here's what I think you were you're asking before. Uh, like, if I'm in a browser, um, it's very easy for me to replicate, duplicate tabs. Yeah. It's very easy. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes there's a good reason for me to do that. I want to get back to a known, it's just a starting point for mm. a new activity. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, because that, that, is a, uh, uh, that is a very natural thing to do in a browser, um, by introducing tabs in, in, you know, where we basically sort of bleed um, the distinction between like web mm -hmm. and app activities. It's just activities, the things you care about. You yeah. should be able to group these things together and go back to them past. There, there may be more of an inclination or belief from a customer perspective that, hey, I should be able to easily duplicate like, like an app tab because yeah. it's just a tab, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and, but there's, there's, there's ramifications to that because it's an app, it's not really a web page, right? It's sure. an activity. Um, and so you know, we're not, I, th I think by introducing tabs, we're not, um, uh, changing the windowing model. We're not forcing apps to become multi-instance capable right. if they don't support it today. Uh, but we are offering as a capability actually today uh, for, for UWP apps to support multi-instance. And like this is actually a scenario where it actually might make sense for UWP application support because in, in, in a sets world, uh, a user might want to have the same instance of the app repeated in the same set or sure. in different sets. Uh, but it's optional. It's not like something that we're requiring apps to do. It's not something that um, we're not going to break app compat and, 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 and re require apps to kind no, of. No, but it is a new way. set of capabilities. I mean, That's right. admittedly, the, the admin client we use for the show is a web page, but it's super yep. normal for me to have two copies open of it because right. I'm looking at one show and I'm working on another show. And so, right. you know, just being able to have multiple instances that I could, if, if it happened to be a UWP app, it's entirely possible I'd, be, I'd want two. That's right. And the idea right. that I could have it in a tab view, so I'm not dealing with two different windows. Like, That's right. Look, I like giant monitors. And yeah. I think there's no, no such thing as too much screen space. Because I, cause tabbing is such a pain in the butt. And I simply didn't want, I want everything I need to see sitting side by yep. side as far as I can go. We've it's, been getting that feedback. Uh, yeah. So we've, we've been... Uh, we had initially rolled this experiment out um, uh, to insiders in December, mm -hmm. early December, uh, and we've been gradually uh, uh, rolling out to more and more insiders for feedback. Cool. Um, one of the feedback that, that is recurring is, uh, uh, sure, if I'm on a small physical display size, um, being able to switch things in tabs makes, makes total sense. Yep. But if I have like two screens, yeah. three screens, or a high-res monitor, uh, I'd really love for the ability to go back to a set of activities that happen to be like you know, adjacent windows. Sure. Right? Hmm. And so yeah. we're thinking through that because it, it, it makes sense. It's a legit... Um, uh, it's a legit, uh, uh, this is a problem. Style that of I, work. This is how yeah. I would like for you to solve the problem. Uh, there are aspects, I have a 43 inch 4K monitor on my yeah. main workstation at home, and there are certain classes of work that will go, oh, I need to do, I'll wait till I get to my yeah. big screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, right. it's just like, you know, it's easier to line up those windows beside each other and go there. But yeah. I, it also occurs to me, like, all tab. And the, brow and the sort of browsing between apps behavior and Windows has not changed since Win 7? Maybe uh, Win 8 was a little, little bit of bit. a difference. Uh, now Wait until the that next uh, Windows Insider update. So uh, you might have seen, folks might have seen in the keynote this morning, um, we have an improvement in Altab, which is uh, the ability to Altab between web tabs. Yeah. Now, ah, nice. Yeah, because they're, again, but it's, it's a web as an activity as an app. These are all activities. Right. It's exciting mm. to me that you guys are, ex no, nothing else, just exploring this. It's like, right. is it time to improve the windowing paradigm with our high DPI, ultra large screens and multi-screen Raymond is nodding machines? his head, yes. Yeah. <laughs> clearly, you're not the only ones thinking of this. I mean, the, the, the station app I just talked about, I mean, in even yes. earlier when early browsers, when tabs came, became a thing, I remember going, ah, that's going to help me a lot. Yeah. You know, it, it just sort of speaks to where people's heads are at with, with information overload and uh, all the applications that they have to use. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. 
Guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time to ask a rhetorical question. Oh. So we have a show with Raymond from 2007 <laughs> on Windows. <laughs> and another show today on sets. How do we knit them together? <laughs> Raymond? <laughs> Okay, you guys are just being silly here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you met us? <laughs> it's, it's actually time to give away a experience subscription from our friends at Developer Express to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But you know, everybody knows that Dev Express has great desktop controls, but their web tools are simply amazing. They have this collection of HTML5 JavaScript controls called Dev Extreme. And at the heart of this product line are these really powerful controls like Grid, Chart, Pivot Grid, Tree List, and Scheduler, but DevExtreme also comes with more than 50 touch-optimized client-side controls. Data visualizers, navigators, editors, lists, dialogues, notification controls, and general purpose controls like a filter builder, range slider, file uploader, scroll view, and more. Since they're all HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, they include integrations with things like jQuery, Knockout, React, Ionic, and Angular. Plus, DevExtreme controls come with ASP.NET MVC and ASP.NET Core wrappers, so they're infinitely flexible. But don't take our word for it. Go for a test drive at dx.netrocks.com. That's dx.netrocks.com. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Ricky Jones. Congratulations, Ricky. Congratulations, Ricky. I'll clap for you. Just won that big pile of awesome from our Good friends. Good job, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> Just for I being. know you worked hard for this. <laughs> Can you come to every show? Yeah. This is awesome. <laughs> we miss you, Matt. <laughs> just I'll for be being, here all week. It's been 11 years. <laughs> uh, just for being a member of the fan club. And if you'd like to join the fan club, go to .netrocks.com, uh, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and you can join too. We like to give away stuff in every show from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of said fan club, but you've got to sign up to win. We also like to ask our guests, guys, if you had $5,000 to spend today on technology, anything at all, what would you buy? Jason? What would I buy for five? Something gadgety. If you're thinking about a Tesla, you could buy the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> Just a charger. The rear view mirror. Yeah. Yeah. You might yeah, get that's, you that's a, a replacement badge. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what all will get you. That's a really good question. Um, no favorite gadgets in your life? Need a new computer? Well, I mean, I was thinking like a high-end Alienware, but like... Uh, Always. Uh, I think... What's your be big more monitor? Ambitious. Do you like a big monitor? Do I? Do you uh, I, I have dual 1080p displays. You I want a big... Do. Actually, I want the big curve monitor. That's yeah, what I the want. 38-inch curves. Yes. Those are nice. Yeah, you should tell everybody about that, because <laughs> I'm sure they've never <laughs> heard of it on this show before. before. <laughs> but you know, for, for the price, you can get two of them, stack them one above the other. I've always wondered just how many you'd need to make a complete circle around yourself. That would be amazing. Yeah, that, would would be. that would be pretty sweet. Think of, think, would, think of the like video that. gaming you could do with that. That's right. Why not? Nobody can sneak up on you. Why not make a dome? Let's just go for the dome, right? <laughs> uh, our, our friend Brian Randall, after hearing about that bloody Dell 43 inch that I keep raving about, yeah. bought three of them. Oh, well. So, so he's, he's got like a half that. circle going. Yeah, they, it's <laughs> not, they're not curved. They're just, that's three forty three. And he had inch. to buy a new chair because his or, yeah. original chair didn't swivel. That's right. You're going to pan a long <laughs> way. Like, let me tell you this. It's no mouse them. pad is big enough. <laughs> <laughs> You just imagine programming with your peripheral vision because oh. you forgot to get a swivel chair. Yes. Yeah, you, you miss all those notifications, man. So what about you, Raymond? What would you I buy with five grand? I'm, I'm actually not that much of... I, I'm not a gadget nerd. Nope. Um, so I guess I would, I, would, I, would, I would spend some of that money to get myself a nice Surface Book. Yeah. Oh, okay. You can... There, I mean, Microsoft's not at the Apple level yet in terms of blowing money on a computer. You can knock out <laughs> three grand yeah. on a Surface Book full of. Right. You know, you're just getting yeah. started with one of those, some of those MacBook Pros with yeah. five grand. <laughs> five thousand, you guys are. You got a starter book. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, this the is starter my, reader. This is, right? this is my starter book. That's it. I'm just getting warmed when up. I really All the fonts make it are big. really big. That's right. When I really make it big, I might add some memory. It only, only shows primary colors like <laughs> we have VGA mode <laughs> oh man I'm, colors saving, I'm for saving up for VGA mode <laughs> I got CGA right now oh, man orange that'd be awesome I love orange orange would be oh, cool. I, I'm just, I got cyan right now I'm getting tired of it <laughs> 
Santa Magenta. Man. There are so many old computer jokes oh, in these, no. these <laughs> past five minutes. <laughs> So we're down to what, three listeners? Yeah. yeah probably. Probably. Both <laughs> guys think heard, we're hilarious. <laughs> just heard a thousand of them shut the <laughs> They're just like, forget this. <laughs> All right, anyway. Uh, so yeah, what, what about it. this idea that, you know, this idea is one whose time has come. Like, it's timely. You see more and more people trying to take the complexity out of all these apps that we have to use and somehow group them together. I mean, it can't be a coincidence that these apps are popping up for web uh, as well as what you guys are doing on Windows, so I, I just I just think it speaks to what people's needs are in in 2018. How did what what prompted the idea of sets in the first place within the walls of Microsoft within the hallowed yeah. walls? Yeah. So 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 um, you guys familiar with virtual desktop? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we we actually Raymond and I are on the team that that um, shipped virtual desktop. Um, okay. Uh, for those who don't know. Yeah, so, so virtual Tell desktop us. is basically it's 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 a it's a way to manage windows on Windows. So there's an easy way for you to essentially create, um, actually organize windows based on of what we call virtual desktop. So if you mm. go if you go to task view, there's a way you say new desktop, right. and it takes you to a place where it looks like it's your desktop and all your windows went away, but actually right. they didn't go away. They're just sort of stowed away for you to get back to easily later. Right. Um, it's it's just a way to sort of organize your windows and then into different sort of workspaces, right? Visually. We Which is sort of what you're doing with sets, but only on exactly the same right. desktop. Yeah. And so, so it's, it's about window management. We, we have, like when we look at telemetry, we have, we have a small percentage of users using virtual desktop. Mm. So that's, that's interesting information for us. Sure. But just as interesting is for the users that are using it, that are engaged with virtual desktop, they're like super, super, super engaged. And the kind of feedback that we're getting is, is how it really helps them to sort of focus, organize workflows. Just, you know, it, it is nice to be able to switch back to a known space mm. uh, to, to get this task done, and then right. to be able to easily switch, you know, very seamlessly switch back to a different space for a different task. Right. Um, so we asked ourselves a question, uh, like, all right, so awesome. We have this ton of like super engagement where we're serving, we're serving this sort of productivity need by the set of users. Yeah. But we have a lot of users of Windows. Yeah. Yeah. And how can we like how can we possibly democratize that, you know, spread to, that to the maximum around. number of users in our ecosystem? Because that's we're about serious productivity, right? Sure. This, is just, this, this is what we're about. This but is in our DNA. There is some just to interrupt for a quick second on a tangent. Yeah. There is some weird stuff that I noticed. And it's, it's obviously has to be designed this way, but if you have opened up an app in one of those virtual desktops and you try to open it in your, another virtual desktop, what happens? It's sort of up to the app to decide yeah. what happens. Sure. We, we have some recommendations. Like mm. if you're an app that, uh, if you're like a web browser and you want to reuse Windows, mm. we recommend that you reuse Windows that belong to the same desktop that the user's currently on rather than kicking the user out to another desktop. Right. But on the other hand, if you're a document-based app and that document is open on another desktop, then it would make sense to switch to yeah. it. So we do we do have guidelines on how right. applications right. should deal with virtual desktops. If your application hasn't hasn't been updated to deal with virtual desktops, then uh, you create a window and we'll put it on the current virtual desktop. Right. And, and that's a pretty good default. It, it's largely lines up with what people want. And then if you're like using hardware resources or something like that in one virtual desktop and you can only use them in one app at a time, now you've got, oh, the, which desktop was that open in? You know, so there are some there are, yeah, there, things. There, there's some, there's some, there's some things uh, that if, if your app really wants to be really clever, mm. you could realize that, oh, I'm not on the current virtual desktop. I should you know, right. scale back. But in practice, nobody bothers. All right. So getting back to how did yeah. the idea come about? Yeah. So we, we so our, our team, we, we, had, you know, we looked at, at feedback. We looked at um, the, the user research mm. and we tried to figure out figure out like why why is it that we're serving this need so well with this mm. this percentage of the audience but we have this huge gap in terms of right it's it, you know, it's 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 not discoverable enough it's yeah. not necessarily intuitive to a lot of people like how can we take that value and deliver mm. it in a way that we can sort of democratize that value to everybody it also um, feels like you're being you're breaking the rules when you do a new desktop it's kind of like <gasps> whoa what happened <laughs> You right. know, where'd all my stuff go? Like, yeah. this is dangerous. Yeah, we, yeah, I mean, we do things visually <laughs> in the operating system to provide cues to kind of yeah. help with that. Like, there's this sort of animation, the, the desktop sort right. of slides. So, you know, it's there, it's on the side yep. virtually. Um, but yes. <laughs> um, uh, it, it can be like startling. My mother, my mother wouldn't be able <laughs> to just freak that. out. I just lost yeah. everything. Right. Yeah. Yep. She'd be on the phone to me, where's all my stuff? <laughs> it's yeah. right but where the, you left it. Yeah. The old apps 
the apps that are running in that other desktop, they're still running when That's you're right. working in the new desktop. That's right. So there is this sort of issue around what all did I actually want running depending on the tasks that I'm working on. That's right. There, there's still a working set um, that's consumed by the things that you don't see on the screen. Right. So, yeah. Right. So, I mean, it, and I just think it's interesting to get to a point where, you know, we were talking about the timeline view where it's like, I can click on this and you're actually going to start stuff that's for right. me. That's right. That if I could start having a few virtual desktops in my pocket, like, this is my configuration for recording a show. This is my configuration for writing tweets for the week. This yep. is, you know, these kind of routine once a week or every other day kind of tasks that I have that you can take a non-trivial chunk of my time back by saying, put me back into that state. That's right. But these so things are loaded and in place and good to go. So you're That's saying right. that you, you built sets and came up with the idea of sets to make it more discoverable, make it more in place on the desktop. Yeah, if you look at, uh, like, like, if you look at the minutes spent on window, like all up on the planet every month, you know, roughly 60% of the minutes spent is going to be like in any given month in a browser. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you ask the question yourself, well, right, what, are the, what are the most common things a person will do on Windows? Uh, what are uh, the most common things window users would do on Windows to group things together, right? Right, right. It's like browsing is very familiar to everyone, right? Sure. Virtual desktop, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a slight learning curve. Well, there yeah. is a learning curve to be able to use that effectively. But with browsing, everybody does it. And so it's a very familiar uh, way to interact with yeah. Windows. And so that, that was sort of how the hypothesis came out. Could we, if we um, provided users with a way to group things together via tapping, like could that be a way we could democratize like how to do this, make it right. just sort of really seamless. And it's a metaphor people are familiar with because of browsing. That's right. Yeah. And uh, Sorry, I got to stop the show. My yeah. Fitbit just told me I got to get up. <laughs> <laughs> Letting machines control your life. I know, yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. He's trying to help me. No, really. So then the, the sets... Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm trying to stay focused here. <laughs> How's the, it working out? Yeah, not well. <laughs> not well. <laughs> Is this bugging you? Is this bugging you? Is this bugging you? <laughs> How, about How, about How about now? How about now? I'm not touching you. How about now? I'm not touching you. <laughs> I have a brother. <laughs> so did he! <laughs> Guys, this is radio gold right here. Let's just uh, be, be honest about it. See, the best part is when we totally ignore the official topic of the day. Right, yes, of, course. No, of course. course. These are very different type of sets than you were planning on. <laughs> so what do you think that um, developers need to think about when uh, even considering using these things as a Windows user and then uh, modifying our, our applications? How easy is it going to be for them to, to play in this sandbox? Yeah, we... Well, it's in, in general, we, we try to set things up so the, the default behavior is pretty close to what the user wants. Mm. Right. Um, but if, so the, the recommendation for app developers to, is to you know, run their app on a machine with sets enabled, see how it behaves. Mm -hmm. Most of the stuff will probably work just fine. There you might find a couple rough edges where it's like, oh, I, if I tweaked this little bit here, I, maybe if I had an option for open a new window versus open a new tab, that would really make sense here. Right. And so there are a couple of you know, targeted fixes you can make to make your app uh, much more uh, sets friendly. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest, the biggest piece of sets is actually something that you don't even see in, uh, immediately, which is the, the publication of activities into the activity feed. Right. And this allows um, the things that the user has been doing to show up in timeline and allows your sets to be restored in a much more uh, meaningful way. Okay. If Because by default, if the app hasn't given us any clues as to what happened, we're just going to launch the app and hope for the best. And right. you'll probably land on the, you know, a home page or a default page. Yeah. But with a little work from the app, the app told us, you know, it's like, hey, he's currently looking at, you know, this particular, you know, page 35 of Pride and Prejudice. Mm. Right. And you can say, you know, so if you want to bring me back, just you know, here's here's a magic string to give back to me that that I will understand to so mean you, you Pride and Prejudice the 35. Yeah, oh, wow. so you, you publish it and you you give it you give it some information, and then the system when it launches your launches your application for restore, it gives you that same information back, and that's what you use to say, oh, this means go to Pride and Prejudice, open to page 35. Because it seems like there's three pieces there. There's what app, what doc. And, and then where. something, yeah, and yeah. where, where context what, within the, the, the X, Y, yeah. something lightweight and from the state. Like yeah. it's right. not the dock so itself, it's the location of the dock. Mm. Right, and so the system knows what app. Right. The system often knows what document. Mm -hmm. And so we can get two out of the three. But right. the, thir the third piece is something where the app really has Much to pitch in. Much sure here, yeah. yeah. 
And you've just got to make that a routine behavior as part of your navigation process in your app that you're reporting back. We were here now. We were That's here right. now. Whenever the we user context now. changes, you would exactly. publish an activity. That's right. Okay. Wow. It's not a lot to do. And is this going to be an SDK we're going to have to install? It, it'll be in the, in the regular uh, Windows SDK. Okay. So you don't even have to install any, any uh, special SDK. Stuff you would already uh, have. So I'm thinking about it's, somebody it's, it's an SDK you've already got on your, it's, it's something that's in your house right, right. now. It's something <laughs> you can make with simple objects yes. in yeah. your kitchen drawer. That's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there is uh, additional libraries for building adaptive cards. This is right. something that uh, was talked about a little bit at the keynote, yep. which allows you to design these beautiful renderings uh, mm -hmm. to help you present the information in, the, in a more attractive way. And mm -hmm. so there, those, those, are, those are all JSON, so you, you could use whatever JSON authoring library you like. Uh, we, also, we also publish in NuGet a NuGet package for constructing adaptive cards if you, if you want to. Dif you're not, different you know, level of, yeah, of behavior either. Depending on how fancy you want to be. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so if, if you've already got you know, your own way of doing JSON, it's like more power to you. Yeah, when, yeah. You, know, you can do it any way you like. But it is just part of the Windows SDK. I'm just thinking about someone who's running the good old-fashioned WinForms at and .NET, thinking, you know, is there anything I can do here to be to be part of this equation? Win, WinForms app will uh, WinForms apps and you know Win32 apps can also publish activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they can open a new tab, open in a new, open in a new window. They they can. Uh, colorize and customize their tab appearance. They can pretty much they have access to the same uh, sets related functionality right. that UWP has. Yeah, special okay. string back. They can pass the magic string in, yes. and it'll yeah. come back to them. All that stuff. It's great. All right. So, did we cover what's in the current release versus you know what's coming up? Well, first we have to decide what we mean by the current release. There's the April release. Yeah. Right. Uh, and sets is not on in that release. Okay. Uh, but sets is on in the insider. Uh, Insider releases. And do we okay. still have a fast ring, slow ring set of rules around I, the insider releases? I don't know what happened to that. So the answer is, yeah. uh, you can ask Donna. Nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you okay. can find her. Yeah, right. But that, I mean, that's part of the equation is who's got it when. Like, obviously, right. we're, we'll take the April release and we'll have timeline and can start, start Right. April, the April release that. has timeline, so you can already code to timeline yeah. today and put your apps, ship them, and... I just think as timeline. a dev, like the first thing I'm going to do is start seeing how I use timeline. Right. And then, then right. you know, as I get a feel for that thing about how would I influence my software around Right, so you might be like, yeah, start, start out as a user and yeah. say, how is timeline useful to me? And then, right. then you put on your developer hat and say, how can my app make timeline better, even better? Yeah. And how, or how can I take advantage of timeline to make it easier for the user to find me? Yeah, I want, I want my apps being more sticky to my users, that they tend to want to go there, it's easy to get there, and so forth. So those kinds of things are yeah. super right. easy it's, to it's do. It's all about spending quality time with your friends. Yeah. yeah. It, <laughs> I want to be your friend. Really, I do. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, sir, you, have the, you have a minute here to push anything you want. Is there anything else you want to say? Yeah. About uh, place we need to go, things tabs, you can do. Tabs, sets, knitting, or anything still else? Still selling that new, new thing, <laughs> or new old thing? The, the, the blog is still there. You just search for Raymond Chen blog, and it'll come up. I see you're posting regularly. Too uh, much more window, you know, detail windows conversations going on these days. Mm. From I've, I've been spending a lot of time digging into architectures of obsolete processors. For some reason, people find that interesting. That's just <laughs> because we are all dorks. <laughs> 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 They're really cool posts, man. Like it's just, it's just stuff I didn't know. I think more people learned about Itanium through my like oh. 14 <laughs> series. Yes. It was like, hey, the processor that just didn't the make processor it. that was just yeah. too far ahead of its time. Well. Yeah, I'm heavily into the history these days for obvious reasons, and yeah, they just this, we were going to do 64 by completely differently. They took so long, and then AMD came along and just said, "You know what? I'll just tweak these couple of things, and you're off." And you're How going. about this? Well, then Dave Cutler jumps in with there's Windows on Windows doc. He goes, "This is the way we should do it," mm -hmm. and then Intel's like, "Holy man, we better do this." And Welcome to Carl and Jason. Listen to two nerds talk about CPUs. <laughs> <laughs> we called it wait, Itanic so this, in the end wait, for so this a reason. This isn't your normal type yeah. of show. <laughs> <laughs> we, do this, we do this every week. <laughs> awesome guys! Uh, thank you. So should much. we talk about? Should we talk about Marvel? I don't know. <laughs> 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 do, do, do you just go into a whole different part of nerddom? No. <laughs> we'll save no. that for next time. Next yeah, time. Absolutely. All next right. time. Guys, thank you very much. Oh, it's, it's great being here. Yeah, great to have you back, and uh, great to meet you, Jason. Thank you. All right, so we'll see here. you next time on Dot Net Rocks.
Net Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and of course in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the end.